Ah, uh, yeah. Welcome today to the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. We've told the story several times already today, and we're going to like review it again in preparation also for those who are going to express their decision to allow this Jesus, who has been raised from the dead, to resurrect their own lives. So I'm so glad that you're here. This is going to be an awesome service together. So we have a family tradition. We've, we've done this a number of times in our family when our kids were growing up. And maybe you've done this too. It's where you just try to tell the story by taking these plastic Easter eggs, right? And, uh, and inside of the empty egg, you put various symbols of the crucifixion of Jesus. Anybody ever play this? And so inside one of the eggs, and then you pass the eggs around, right, to the kids. And as you go around the table, you know, and you, you open up the egg, and inside one may have, what, like two pieces of wood, which stands for what? Right? The cross, right? And then you would have another, they'd open it up, and it would, it would have, like, some thorns. It would stand for what? The crown of thorns. And you open up another one, and it would have, like, a, a strip of, of cloth, right? Which stands for? Right. The burial cloth. And you open up another one, and it would have like, like uh, coins, which would stand for the 13 or the 30 pieces of silver that, uh, that Judas received for betraying Jesus. And on and on it would go. And then there was this one egg that somebody, some lucky person would get, and you would open up, and like there would be nothing. There'd be nothing in it. Now, at that point, as a kid, you might feel cheated. You go, what? There's nothing in mine? But as it turns out, the parents come to the rescue and explain to you, said, no, 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 this is, this, is, this is really the best egg, right? You open it up, it's empty, which stands for the empty tomb. The empty tomb. And this is like the celebration of this day. The empty tomb that Jesus is now alive. But it wasn't a foregone conclusion in the minds of the disciples. With hope crushed, with despair setting into their hearts, with the light having gone out. Friday's news, as well as Saturday morning's was, that the so-called Messiah was dead. There are things that hit our lives uh, like pretty hard when we experience various losses. I, I watched over the last uh, a few days uh, as many of you did too, the astonishing sight of a Notre Dame cathedral burning. And as it was burning and the spire on that famous cathedral toppled, the gasps, the sobs, the, the prayerfulness of people all throughout France and those that were right near there, as they, as they watched this happen, they, they were devastated. They were devastated. Not only that, it was a, a, like a, a piece, a, amazing, historic, 850-year-old piece of architecture, but also it had, had contained all these valuables, you know, these, these paintings and these statues and so forth. And, and not only that, though, that it had, it had a, a religious value. It had, it, it had a, a, a sense of spirituality for people who oftentimes, although it was easy to, perhaps to neglect. It was just one of those amazing buildings that was there. But when it's burning, all of a sudden you see it differently. You're drawn to it. You feel the sentimental loss. There are other losses that are, that are really much more personal, not, not just the sentimental loss. I mean, I felt the sentimental loss of it because uh, of, of just like the value that I've placed on it and I see in it. There are those who experience real personal deep losses where it's not sentimental, it's like dearest, nearest and dearest to you. It's, it's, it's like uh, the uh, mom of, of, uh, of a couple that we knew years ago that when their son was just about to graduate from college the night before graduation, he drowned in an accident and uh, he had been a leader in the student body and all and it was a devastating time. And, and months later, the mom was writing out these, uh, these little, uh, you know, uh, magnets for the refrigerator or necklaces and what all. And yet she had this one saying that she was writing and it, it said this. It said that grief is not a problem to be solved. It just means that you love somebody. Today, when you woke up, if you saw the news, there was 
terrorist attacks in Sri Lanka that took the lives upon churches, Christian churches that took the lives of over 200 people. Devastating on an Easter. And I'm just thinking about the song with Notre Dame and also with Sri Lanka and all the other things that have happened within our lives, you know. And, and that happens on this, on this uh, wake of, of Friday. I just think about the song that we sang, which is uh, out of the ashes of defeat, the resurrecting Lord is resurrecting me. Amen? The resurrecting Lord is resurrecting me out of the ashes. And for some of us, they're very real. They're very, it's very visceral. You, you feel it deeply. You know? It's not just sentimentality. It's, it's a deep loss. Well, that's what Mary felt. When, when Mary went to the tomb, and, and we'll talk about what happened at Easter again and just uh, for these few minutes here. But when Mary went to the tomb, uh, it was like, are you, are you kidding me? And, and, and as she went there, she found that the body of Jesus was gone. Uh, I have visited uh, a site in Jerusalem that is one of a couple that are determined to be possible sites for the resurrection of Jesus, the tomb. And I remember visiting there, and I remember being invited to go inside. And, and when I went inside, I actually didn't expect anybody to be there because I know the story, right? And when Mary went, she expected not a resurrection. She expected that she would be able to complete, um, you know, the, a proper burial for Jesus. And when she gets there, the body is gone. Now, how bad can this day get, right? The story gets worse, right? The story just piles upon. And she looks at these two angels that are there, and she says, where have you put him? Where have you taken him? You know, what... What is going on? I mean, I don't understand what is going on. Mary, after she runs from that place, probably expressing her own devotion, her own emotion about all of this. She, you know, have you ever run like in a panic before? <laughs> she was running like in a panic. She doesn't know who to go to. Oddly enough, it's really interesting. She goes to the very person who had denied Jesus. She goes to Peter. <laughs> In the story in John 20, she goes to Peter and she said, they've taken his body. So Peter and John, they run to the tomb, as you saw portrayed here. And they look inside and there's a whole other story wrapped up in there. But I want to focus upon Mary for this morning. When they leave, she stays. She just uh, weeps. She is filled with sadness. She uh, is broken. And it says so interestingly about her that, that in this very moment when she is so overcome that, that she uh, is not rep reprimanded for her tears. She's not uh, scolded for her unbelief. She, there's just this compassionate response. Why are you crying? And, and later there will be a response from Jesus as why you're crying. And this woman, this this woman that, that is privileged to be at this moment, though she does not understand the privilege of it at this time, this woman is just like an ordinary person. I, I, love, I love the gospel story. I love, I love how, you know, it's like the heroes in the story, they, they, don't, they don't start out as heroes, right? The people in the play, the characters in the story, they, they don't start out as supermen and superwomen. <laughs> they start out as ordinary. I love the words of James Martin who, who talks about this when he says that it's this, here's this very ordinary woman who, who meets up with Jesus. I, you, you say, well, what do we know about her? Mary Magdalene, right? And may, maybe you know something about her, but if you don't, let me just say uh, something about her at, at the very core. She was a broken woman. <laughs> she was harassed, likely due to the past wounds, to deep trauma, to the uh, reality of, of, of demonic powers working against her life. She was driven, <laughs> not into life, but into more and more experiences of death. We know that because the Bible talks about her in a way, way back in one of the Gospels, it says that she became one of the followers of Jesus, out of whom Jesus had cast seven demons. 
right? Now, I don't know, you know, that just kind of like complicates the whole issue, right? You can have trauma and you can have difficulty and you can be like struggling with all that. But when, when evil particularly enters into all that and just kind of grinds the wound deep into your heart and when you find yourself not being able to like, not, not being able to really control yourself and being controlled by darkness, that is exactly what is happening to this woman. And she meets Jesus, this ordinary, or some might say subordinary person. She meets Jesus, and Jesus heals her. Jesus sets her free. Isn't that incredible? He just absolutely does an amazing thing for this ordinary woman. And here she is, the woman who comes to the tomb. The woman who just like can't let go of the fact that Jesus, who has set her free, is dead and must give his body a proper burial. Well, everything's about to turn. Something amazing takes place. A surprising moment. And you read about it when, when all of a sudden uh, she is there weeping and it says this. She turns around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? And who is it that you're looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, which I thought, I think is just really a, a very interesting thing. Uh, thinking that he was the gardener. I don't know, I, you know, the, sun, the light of the morning, uh, the blurry eyes from the crying, that complete lack of any possibility in her mind that Jesus was alive. And, and she hears him say, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. It's just too easy to run past all those words. But you, you, can, you can just say, I, I, I must... I must see him, even if he is dead. I want to put my act of love in these spices, in, in this, in this uh, memorializing of his body and his life. I want, I want to be where he is. Will you please tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. And in that moment of just the inks of her words, Jesus says to her something she will never forget. Jesus calls her by name. Jesus says, Miriam. And immediately recognizing him, she turns toward him and cried out in Aramaic, which is like the language of the home, Rabboni, which means teacher or my teacher. Like these two words, like it's like history for her, but also for all of us, hangs on these two amazing names. Miriam, which she recognized, her Lord speaking her name. And then Rabboni, my teacher, the one who has changed my life, the one who, who I am following, the one who, is, who has brought me out of darkness into light. She recognizes him. There's just something that happens when love speaks your name. When love speaks your name. A lot of us have ever ha had our name spoken, <laughs> but not always in love, right? Do you, do you know how you can tell that God is speaking to you? I think the foremost way in which you know that God is speaking to you is that God says your name in love. He speaks to you in love. He doesn't, he doesn't, his first words out of his mouth are not scolding you and condemning you and, uh, you know, reminding you about how holy he is and how unholy you are. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of distance between his holiness and mine. 
I know there's a lot of gap to be closed here. But when Jesus comes to us, he doesn't first come shaming us at all. That is not his way. Many of us have heard the way of religion, which would shame and accuse. But it's not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of God. He speaks your name. He loves you. He loves you. In spite of all that you've done, in spite of everything that's been a mess, this woman, her life certainly messed over time and time again. And yet, Jesus has spoken her name. I like how one person described it. Mary didn't recognize him at first, but as soon as he spoke her name, that distinctive voice with the, with the accent from Nazareth, that voice that called her into wholeness, that voice that expelled demons from, that had troubled her, the voice that welcomed her into his circle of friends, the voice that had told her that she was valued in the eyes of God, the voice that answered her questions, the voice that laughed over a meal, the voice that counseled her near the end of his earthly life, the voice that cried out in pain from the cross. She was there, you know. Mary knew that voice because it was a voice that had spoken to her in love and she recognized who it was because sometimes seeing is not believing, but loving is. It's powerful, right? So all of a sudden, in this moment, she like turns around. It says she turned and she saw him, right? She turns around and responds to him. Just in that, I mean, like in two seconds. One, one side of that two seconds was the darkness in her soul. And then the other side of the two seconds was a hope, a restoration, a joy, a rush that cannot even be described, right? He is risen. He is risen. He's risen indeed. And all of human history there in that one moment tells us that, that what has been inconquerable in death was now absolutely overcome. And that Jesus was alive not only for Mary, but also for all of us. You see, that day matters. This day matters. That's why we make a big deal about Easter. But, but really, every Sunday when we gather, it's a celebration of his life. That's why this day matters. Um, we had like a, uh, maybe if you go to one of the Puyallup High Schools, you had the opportunity to uh, uh, listen to Kevin Hines this past week. So Kevin Hines, who was all about talking about suicide prevention. Uh, and then he showed up at the high schools, and then he showed up and he spoke at a group of parents and, and uh, youth groups and, and uh, uh, students as well, all at uh, the fairgrounds on Wednesday night. And he just talked about this amazing experience of his own, but also just trying to tell people, look, you don't have to live with death dealing a blow to you. You can actually make a decision to move into life. He tells about his own story. You may remember it if you, you will remember it if you were there. I'll just summarize it. But he, he was a man who had jumped uh, several years earlier. He had jumped to commit suicide off the Golden Gate Bridge. Now, if you've been there, that is a high bridge. And the landing is a hard landing. He says this, that as soon as he let go, he realized he had made the biggest mistake of his life. He landed hitting the water. I mean, I've, I've fallen on water skis and it felt like I hit concrete. I can't imagine what that fall would have been like. Miraculously, he lived, broken legs, just all kinds of deep, deep injuries. And as he's drowning, he starts crying out to God, God, save me, right? God, save me. All, all of a sudden, in that moment, to his surprise, and well, really, to his shock, there was a sea creature that came around him. I'm thinking it's a shark, right? That's circling around him and, and is kind of all of a sudden carrying him up. It's a sea lion. He's drowning, and the sea lion is underneath him and lifting him up, right? So that just as the Coast Guard arrives, he is lifted to the surface, and he is, he's saved. The captain of the boat, points to him, the captain of the boat points to him and says, do you know how many bodies I've taken out of this bay? He said, 50, what, 6 or 57? 57. 
Do you know how many bodies I've taken out alive? One. That's you. There was a saying that he uh, adopted from an earlier book written in 1902 and later used in what? Uh, panda, what is it? What's the panda movie? Kung Fu? I always say Kung Fu Panda. It says this. You ready? Yesterday is history. T tomorrow is mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. Repeat after me. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is mystery. Today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. That's what it was like for Mary on that day. Today is a gift. This day matters. Resurrection matters. See, coming to life, coming to life matters. Out of your graves, out of our death, out of our bondage to all the kinds of stuff that, that chain us up to the past and that ruin our future. And, and, and all of a sudden, like this dawns upon Mary, something miraculous has happened, this amazing depth of God's love. You know what she does? She just lays hold of Jesus. <laughs> she just like, I mean, wouldn't you? <laughs> wouldn't you just like? And I, I think it's beautiful that, that, that Jesus is touchable and Jesus is affectionate and Jesus like is not, you know. Now he does say, don't, don't keep hanging on to me. Sometimes you misread that and misinterpret that as saying, don't touch me. It's not what it says. It says, don't keep hanging on to me. Because we have a mission. There's some good news to be told. So go, right? So go. Give, tell, tell the disciples. No, exactly what he says is this. Go to my brothers and tell them. Now, don't miss this. Who, who, who is he talking to? The disciples. The ones that had ditched him. The ones that had ditched him whenever he was being, uh, you know, judged and, and, and beaten and crucified. They all, they all split, right? Courageous men. <laughs> They're all gone. And he says, go tell my brothers. You know what he's saying? He's saying, go, go tell them. I, it's like I have forgiven them. He doesn't say, go tell those jerks that I was right. That's what you and I would have done, right? <laughs> we just say, all right, my day has come. Go tell them. No, not at all. He says, go tell my brothers. And go tell them that I'm ascending. See, there's not only forgiveness, but go tell them that I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father. He says, not only are you forgiven, not only are you like my brothers, but you are also in my family, and my Father is your Father. My Abba is your Father. My Papa is your Father. My, my Abba is yours. Welcome to the family. That's really at the heart of the gospel. I read the story this week about a judge, a judge in a third world country, a judge had, had just told an accused orphan boy that he had been acquitted. And then, without even breaking stride, he said in an unprecedented and even shocking manner, the judge said to the boy, not only are you acquitted, but I and my family want to adopt you. <laughs> You see, God doesn't just forgive us and then send us out into the streets again. Lost, disconnected. But he adopts us into his family. And this is what is happening in the resurrection of Jesus. For you and for me. So I'm sure the news read... <laughs> I'm sure the news read on the weekend, Saturday news, death is one. But as one person wrote, but Sunday's breaking news is that Jesus has won the weekend. Amen? He has won the weekend. Praise be to God. So in a few moments, there are going to be people who are going to be baptized. They've planned on this. They're prepared for this. There's a scripture that says in the Older Testament, in the prophet Ezekiel chapter 37, there's this vision, this story that is uh, kind of seen out in this vision that there's a valley full of dry bones and, 
And, and the whole idea is, can these bones live? And after this miracle of the, of the bones coming together and there's new life, there's this word. I think it's just really a powerful word. Our bones, we, we say our bones are dried up and our hope are gone and is gone and we are cut off. But this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I'm going to bring you back and I'm going to settle you in your homes. And this is exactly what God loves to do for people like you and me. He loves to raise us up out of our graves of fear and addiction and oppression out of the demonic ways in which the evil one has simply fed us the lie that we don't matter and that there is no hope. He loves to raise us up out of bitterness over past events and bring us to a place that we can call home. Amen. And this is what he does in Jesus Christ. So as these come to be baptized right now, we're going to be standing, we're going to be singing uh, after we listen to their testimonies. And here's what I want to say to you. To you. Even if you are not prepared before the service to be baptized, but if on this good day of the news that Jesus has won victory for you, if you desire to be baptized, I will baptize you. And then we will help you discover how to walk in a new relationship with Jesus Christ. You didn't bring a change of clothes? That's okay. We will send you home wet. <laughs> but it will be a good wet. Right? It will be a good wet. This day is God's day. And this day, because it is God's day and because he has loved us so much, this day is the people's day that we might live again, right? Amen. So bless you. Listen to these testimonies. And then we'll stand and we'll sing and we'll baptize these and any others who desire to be baptized today.